Ron, great to have you with us today and congratulations on being a CIO Next honoree with Forbes. I appreciate that. Thank you. Glad to be here. Great. So HP, so you're the global CIO of HP, massive company, six point, uh, sorry, 63, I think, 0.5 billion dollars of revenue in 2021. PCs, printers, digital manufacturing, that's a, that's a heck of a lot going on there. What's your role as, as global CIO? What kind of range of responsibilities do you have? So as a global CIO, my primary responsibility is to the 50 to 60,000 employees of this great organization. In almost every time zone we have, all 24, ensuring that they're optimizing their um, opportunities to work with our systems, to make sure they're proficient and they get the best they need to kind of deliver to our end customers and those we serve. Got it. So it's really kind of like uh, the, the employees first and then that feeds through to the customers afterwards. Absolutely. In some areas, we actually do provide direct to the consumer through our websites that we kind of oversee and manage. But overarching, we just want to make sure our employees are happy and they're functional, especially during the times that we're in today. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a tough ride over the last couple of years. Absolutely. I, I've seen you kind of talk about the five E's as your philosophy of leadership. You know, can, what are those E's? Yeah, so my guiding principles are five E's and I've used them over my previous four opportunities as CIO, and I brought them here at HP. And, and the first one for me is enable. Our job is to enable our employees. That's very important, enable our employees, our customers. The next one is explore. Explore what's next. It's so important that we see what's on the next horizon and we can prepare for that. But engagement is also very important, especially in a time where everyone's transient, everyone's working through collaborative tools. The other two E's that are very important to me are eliminate waste. There's a lot of opportunity that technology could do to eliminate waste, um, adding bots, making things more intuitive so our employees can focus on what's most important. And the final one is evangelize value. We have to do a better job of evangelizing the value because when our CFOs give us funding, we have to make sure we're showing value for that investment and show really the long term why this is a good thing for the organization. That's so important because you know often I get the impression that uh, you know people can get carried away with the technology without seeing the real business value that it delivers. So you work very closely with your C-suite colleagues. Absolutely. So a lot of times we represent, we have quarterly reviews, we explain the investment you provided us, this is the outcome of it. If we want to move forward on our NIST, for example, if we want to move forward on our CMMI, here's where the investments are actually bringing the most bang for the buck because, again, it's not finite, so we've got to make sure we're very intelligent with the investments that we do have. Got it. So NIST is the, the cybersecurity framework. What's CMMI? CMMI is... Um, that's the way we get our management and maturity matrix. And it's the way to make sure that how are we doing? Are we at a one, two, three, four, or five? Maybe we should be at a five in certain areas, but we're okay to be at a three at others. So it's a standard way to keep ourselves honest. It's like a scorecard. Got it. Are you a five? No, we're not a five, but we're <laughs> certain You're areas. on your way. We're on our way in certain areas. In some ways, a four is actually just good enough for us. So we want to make sure that we continually to adapt and move those forward. Got it. Yeah. Um, I mean, you talked about sort of eliminating uh, as one of those E's, and yes. I know you've been eliminating ERP systems. Can you talk us through that? I mean, you had a massive number, right, when you started? Correct. So actually, when I joined, the, the train already left the station. And the beautiful thing about it is I was able to kind of bring it to fruition with a great team with the business. So there was 13 ERP systems. We collapsed that down to one global instance and we actually were able to move it on a new hosting strategy as well. And the idea there is now we have one backbone, one platform for the org, and now we can build on top of it. So the way I always say it is the ERP was really the start. Now we can do so many things on top of that to make sure that we're more successful and we're lean where we need to be. Got it. And then um, Agile as well. You've been on a kind of Agile journey. Um, can you talk through that and like give an example of something, I mean, maybe around pricing, where you've kind of seen the benefits feed through to the employees or to the customers? Absolutely. We've been doing a lot more journey mapping. So we've been a lot do value chain mapping. And so we've been looking at from cradle to grave, from configure to pricing to quoting, and how do we do it better and streamline those practices? Hmm. We actually question, if we have five steps today, why can't we do three? Why can't we automate it and go down to one? So we constantly, continually change and challenge ourselves through like a Kaizen philosophy. But the most important thing is when it comes to DevOps and Ops and Sec, 
we want to make sure that SEC, for example, cybersecurity, for example, is early on in the conversation so it's not an afterthought. So it's so important to bring that on early through the iteration discussion with our business partners. So that's the shifting left of security, right? Bringing it earlier in the process. Absolutely, so we could actually stage gate it early on to catch anything that may have been kind of missed later. And so we can be a lot more nimble and um, agile as we move forward. And that's actually, so far, it's going well. That's great. Yeah. Um, I know you're particularly passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you know, in your submission for the CIO Next Awards, I mean, one of the things that stood out to me was this kind of target that you set. I mean, it's the first time I've seen a CIO kind of step up and say, we're going to have this target. And the target, I think, is to have the US IT team at Hewlett Packard, the kind of the racial mix of that, match the racial mix of the US by 2030. A um, couple of questions. I mean, yes. Uh, how are you going to do it? Mm -hmm. And to why 2030? Why not 2026 or 2027? That's a great question. And you know, it's been documented many times over in STEM fields, STEAM fields, uh, racial diversity is not where it needs to be. And the U.S. makeup is actually 13% of the U.S. population is black African American. So why not have 13% of my staff being black African American? And that will actually be the low mark. Why not beat that? So the things we're doing across the board is we're actually partnering with HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. We partner with them. We have, um, we have bake-offs. We have other things that we're partnering with, like challenges, which is great. Uh, I meet with the HBCU CIOs to start talking about what curriculums are they training and what I'm hiring for to make sure we match those appropriately. That makes sense. And we have various forums that we bring together on that. And the one thing about HP, which I really, really enjoy, is um, the organization has been extremely ahead of and progressive in this space. But it also focuses on Latinos and Latinas as well, and women. We have a bold goal that 50% of our leadership in 2030 will be women. Uh, our bold goal in, in 2030, 33 plus percent of our engineering staff will be women. And we're being very intentional. The way we see it is if you put your goals out there and you make it in a public forum, we will deliver on them. Got it. I mean, uh, so would the women, that 50% women in senior leadership, would that translate into the IT team as well? Absolutely. And this is a beautiful thing. When I joined, I had a chance to kind of um, reconfigure my team. I intentionally um, made sure that I had four women and four men on my leadership team. So I'm already starting out of the gate 50% women. And the goal is those women will help hire more women. And the men on the team will also be very, where, um, very aware uh, and very intentional as to who they bring on as well. And so we want to make sure we keep on moving that forward. In the last two years, we have made progress in that space, but there's a lot more work to do. Got it. And, and then in terms of the speed, I mean, 2030, is that like a kind of deliberate because it gives you the, the runway you need to be able to get that talent in? Co correct. We have a, a huge model market in 2025, which we're kind of trending towards. Okay. And one of those things we're also looking to do is we hire a lot of outsourced providers, right? Like every company, every CIO does. And we want to start with 10% of that spend goes to African-American owned um, technology companies. And then we're going to raise that up in, in future years. But the first start is to really, really be intentional as who we partner with and make sure that they are also well represented. That's fantastic. Yeah. Great, great initiatives. Um, before you joined HP, you, know, you were in government, right? If I remember, some of this, the wonderful state of Illinois, you yes. were their chief technologist, or technology leader. Um, what did you learn while you were in government that you've brought into the, the role at HP? What kind of key learnings, key messages? Have you brought well, the key learning, that the number one is scarcity truly breeds innovation. I say that because the state of Illinois was a phenomenal opportunity to serve my home state and serve Governor Pritzker on his cabinet. And to give back to my home state and roll out broadband, we did a lot of things before we knew the pandemic was coming that due to that, the pandemic was not as painful when it comes to e-learning, telehealth. And so those learnings I brought into this role as well. The other one, and I've always had this, was more of an empathetic ear. We're all going through this during the pandemic and we have to be very aware that we have to give people space. We have to give them the opportunity to work-life integration. I used to say balance, like many, but I truly believe it's about integration. How do you integrate the two? Because at the end of the day, we have to serve those that we um, support, and it's very important. But again, the state was a phenomenal opportunity to learn from that. The last thing I'll say from the state was really being intentional to serve the communities around us. I was responsible to kind of roll out broadband, but more importantly, the digital divide is a serious issue. So how do we move that and be more progressive? So I partner with a lot of our SLED team at HP, and we do a lot of discussions on how do we get what, to What's now. a SLED team? Oh, uh, state, a local, local education. 
Got it. Um, teams, sorry. No, that's yeah. Not. Yeah, and so make sure we're partnering with them to say, here's where we need to invest in our communities. And, and HP is phenomenal at doing so. Got it. I, I mean, are there any particular examples you can give that other you know, CIOs could learn from? Uh, so, so the one thing that I've always done is you have to get out there. Um, I mm -hmm. learned something from one of my past jobs. It's called Genshi Genbutsu, Go Look, Go See. But at HP, they have the same philosophy. You can't work from your desk only. You have to go out, look, and touch. And Bill and Dave did that coming out of the garage. So you have to go out, talk to your employees, talk to those who are using your, your, your products, and learn from them. Again, Chigan, but so that's, that's a Toyota thing, isn't that it? That is a Toyota that? thing. Oh. 19 years there. You can't. 19 years. I worked there for 19, and I learned a lot, starting from repo agent up to the CIO. So a lot of learnings in that role. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, last question. Yes. Uh, what excite, what's around the corner that really excites you? So you see something coming up, you're like, wow. I mean, it could be a technology, could be a trend, could be, what would, what would you pick? The thing that I would pick is what Mother Nature has done to us and how we're going to come out of it. And when I say that, this pandemic, it has truly accelerated what all CIOs have been talking about. Get in front of digital, get ahead of it. Um, our workforces have always been somewhat hybrid. We have sales teams, marketing teams, they've always been in that realm. Now we're scaling it to the whole company. And so what excites me about this opportunity is how do you get everyone to work? And so their experience at home is just as exciting as their experience in the office. It's a challenge because there are three things you have to get right. You have to make sure you get the data right on the edge. You have to make sure that you get the architecture right. Things have to talk to each other. And the third thing that's most important is the cyber aspect. You have to make sure that you're ring fencing everything because it's not just in your office, it's anywhere, anytime, any place on any device. Got so it. it's so important. So it's the digital acceleration that's come out of the pandemic. I mean, it's a terrible thing, yes. but it has this kind of silver lining in the sense of it's shown everybody what a digital first future can look like. Absolutely, and I'd say Mother Nature, unfortunately, forced us into this predicament, but we're gonna take the most out of it. And the beautiful thing about AHP is the acquisition of Poly and other organizations. How do you bring the peripherals into that conversation? So you're bundling the experience for the person, the employee, or the student. So that's the exciting part. That's great. Ron, thank you for talking with Forbes. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Martin, appreciate it too.